Welcome to Accountable, where your business is our business. Hosted by David R. Peters. Today's guest is Chris Hervishon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Accountable, the podcast for CFOs by a CFO. Hey, my name's Dave. Thank you so much for being a part of the show this week. Thanks for joining us. Um, So my guest this week on Accountable is uh, Chris Hervishon. And uh, Chris has a unique story. He uh, has uh, started his own accounting firm, and uh, he is offering virtual CFO services. So this show, I guess uh, you could say, is maybe a little bit different uh, from what we normally do. You know, most of the time we kind of have one topic uh, that we dig in deep on uh, with our with our guest. This show uh, is going to be a little bit different because I think Chris's uh, situation and his story is a bit unique. Uh, more recently, a lot of you know that uh, I've been doing a lot more in uh, the area of just uh, talking about starting up a business and kind of what's involved in that and uh, um, just, uh, you know, kind of how to do that. I think uh, just with the great resignation um, and just uh, kind of everything uh, that has uh, been going on with our economy, I think a lot of folks are really interested in how to get started on their own. And so uh, I've been doing the uh, AICPA uh, podcast, uh, uh, Beyond Disruption, and um, the uh, the Going Beyond Disruption podcast. Uh, I've been uh, I've been a recurring guest. I've been there uh, once a month, and um, I've I've really enjoyed doing that. Um, that uh, the podcast has has been great, and uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, just talking about how to actually start a business. Well, today, uh, you know, we're going to be talking to somebody who successfully started an accounting firm and uh, has uh, uh, has uh, been uh, doing very well with it. And I think that's a, another sort of part that is unique. Uh, I mean, aside from, you know, how to get a business off the ground is Chris is offering a service that I think a lot of us have heard of, but I, I still think it's a rather new idea uh, in the world of accounting, it's it's a newer concept. Uh, virtual CFO services. I think we all kind of understand intuitively what the concept is. I mean, you're a CFO for a company that doesn't have one, and you're doing it uh, primarily remotely. But uh, you know, how do you get started doing that? Uh, what exactly, uh, you know, kind of the the nuts and bolts and uh, kind of the details around that service? That's the part that I think uh, is probably most interesting. I don't think a lot of uh, accounting firms are really doing much with it right now, and so therefore, I think it's kind of an interesting thing to talk about. I also think that it's uh, interesting, and and one of the things that we're going to touch on with Chris is uh, just about uh, you know how exactly do you offer kind of a a service that is uh, specialized. Chris uh, uh, specializes his uh, virtual CFO services for marketing agencies. So again, very unique, I think, especially right now where it seems like every accounting firm is trying to offer, uh, you know, all services to everyone, Uh, you know, whereas Chris has, uh, you know, uh, uh, been able to kind of uh, find a need uh, in the market uh, with offering kind of one service. So, uh, So I think Chris has a unique story. And um, I think that uh, this is going to be a great show. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're touching on a lot of uh, really interesting things here today. And uh, uh, Chris is a good guy, too. So uh, so it's uh, this uh, should be a great, great show. I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Chris Hervishon. My guest this week on Accountable, Chris Hervishon. Chris, how are you? Never better, Dave. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Thanks so much for being on Accountable uh, this week, uh, because I think that your story is unique. I I think that uh, your career path is just, uh, it's different. So tell me a little bit about your career journey. I mean, you're laughing already, because I think that uh, you know that, uh, you know, that uh, it seems like everybody in accounting, nobody kind of takes a straight path, do they? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Certainly, I didn't. I started as a golf pro. Okay. Uh, yeah, which lasted about five minutes, and 
Then I went from there to forensic accounting and I was in the subset of forensic accounting where we basically audited insurance claims, fires, floods, hurricanes, that sort of thing. And then I got into the more traditional accounting path, which has kind of led me to where I am today. So I went and worked for a big bank and that was my first foray into corporate finance. That was, and at the time we were up in New Jersey. So I was living in New Jersey, working in Delaware. We moved down to South Carolina, took another corporate finance job. You know, went through a few mergers and acquisitions, worked my way up the ladder, so to speak. And uh, when I went, did my, actually, when I got my CPA, when I was in my first corporate accounting job, I started this side hustle, just doing like bookkeeping and some tax work on the side. Right. And that kind of grew concurrently with, you know, where I was in my career. And so at some point I just said, Hey, this, I'm not having fun in my nine to five. And I feel like I can drive value for myself and for my clients a little bit better if I was doing it full time. And so I made the decision and made the jump. And it's been a little over three years now. Have kids haven't missed a meal. So it's going okay. <laughs> there you go. So so now you know you're you're doing your own thing. You're running your own business. And um, you know, that presents its own unique set of challenges. I mean, uh, I uh, I know that uh, you know I've talked to multiple small business owners. I am a small business owner. What what was sort of the the tipping point that really kind of led you to strike out on your own? Because I, I think for everybody, it's maybe a little bit different. Because I think for uh, you know for some people, it's this uh, you know this kind of this big epiphany, and then for other folks, it's just uh, you know it's just kind of natural progression. Uh, what what would you say kind of tipped you into saying I got to do this? Sure, it was, a, it was a little bit of both. I, I had an epiphany sitting in my office one day and I just said, I don't want to do this anymore. So that was kind of the epiphany. And really what it boils down to for me is just having control over my schedule and my life and being able to work with who I want to work with and do the work the way that I want to do the work and and you know that sort of thing and really drive value for, for clients and for my family. And you've only got limited control when you're working for somebody else, you know, in, right. in those regards. So at that point, it's just like, you know, when I, I've got this side hustle thing, let's see if we can make, make a go of it. And let's see if we can't, uh, you know, make it work and have fun doing it. So that's kind of the path that we're on. Um, and it's been fun so far. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, you mentioned a couple of interesting things there. Uh, you, you know, the first thing that you said was flexibility. I do think that, uh, you know, especially being out on your own, you do get a fair amount of flexibility. But I, one of the things that I always warn people about, especially my small business clients when they're coming in and they say, hey, I'm thinking about going into business for myself, is flexibility doesn't necessarily mean more time. <laughs> um, you know, you don't necessarily get, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, now you have sort of all of this time off and, uh, you know, you're making all of this money and things like that. Uh, statistically, that doesn't seem to really happen a lot. Certainly not in the early days. I mean, if I want to go play golf right after we're done recording this podcast, I can go play golf right after we're done recording this podcast. However, the three tax returns that I didn't get done still need to get done at some point, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, it just means that you're shifting your daylight hours. When, if you want to go pick up the kids from school, if you want to take the kids to school, you can do that. If you want to go to the kids' soccer game, you can do that. But at the end of the day, the work still has to get done. So you're just kind of shifting your time around and you're not, you know, you don't have to ask for permission to do it. You don't need to take PTO to do it. You just kind of go and do it, which is great. And it's worth something for sure. sure. But the work still has to get done. Right, right. Yeah, at the end of the day, for sure. Now, now your firm's a little bit uh, different because you've ventured into some services that I would say are maybe not necessarily sort of traditional CPA services. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I definitely wanted to touch on with you here today is talking about kind of virtual CFO services, uh, because I think that this is a little bit unique. Uh, there's not a ton of firms, I don't believe, that are out there that are really doing this. Uh, certainly some firms are doing it, but uh, you, I think, uh, have really sort of embraced this virtual CFO idea. And uh, specifically, from what it sounds like, you're, you're focusing in on marketing uh, agencies. Is that right? Tell us a little bit Correct. about kind of uh, kind of that virtual CFO services and what does that mean? Right. Uh, so I, I consider it to be virtual CFO light. Um, and what that kind of encompasses is the bookkeeping, the virtual controller type stuff. So making sure that everything's accurate and making sure that everything's uh, organize the way that it should be, but then layering on some um, some other value add services like you know what I think other CPAs are classically uh, defined as dashboarding. That's something that we do, and it's a financial reporting package, and we build in forecasting and things like that into that. So we have you know one platform that our clients can go and look at 
you know, for uh, historical actuals and then also for, for forecast. So that would be one of the things, uh, wrapping valuation and valuation concepts into the engagement as well. Um, I'm a CBA and been a CBA for, I don't know, seven, eight years, I think at this point, it's been a minute. Um, but that's a skill set that I had and a skill set that kind of dovetailed off of my experience in forensic accounting. And I thought that, you know, if we can package that in there as well, you know, helping clients to create value in their business. Cause one of the things I hear all the time is, Hey, uh, you know, I've got this agency and we're scaling, whatever scaling means to them. Right. Right. It means yeah, something sure. different to everybody. <laughs> Uh, and we're scaling and we want to sell it in two years. We want to sell it in five years or we're going to, you know, merge or whatever. Um, uh, if you're helping clients to, to frame that value conversation and giving them proactive steps on here's how you can build value. Um, I think it's a good thing first for the client, but then also it helps us to, um, kind of quantify the value that we're driving with our services. So that's one of the things that, or one of the problem points that we've, we've tried to solve for in that area too. Other things like cash flow and cash flow management, things like that. I think those are fairly common, but it's just wrapped into one service. And that's what, you know, we classify as virtual CFO. So, so would you say, uh, because, because I think when, uh, cause when you say sort of CFO light, uh, do you do kind of a strategic planning and that kind of stuff for clients as well? Or is that something that you kind of leave to them and they, they kind of take that on themselves? Yeah. So the classical answer is it depends, it depends on the client <laughs> It depends. Yeah. It depends on the conversations that we, that they want to have, but generally speaking, Anything that we can do and do well, we'll help with that. If it's okay. something that it's it's beyond the scope of our knowledge, or it's you know just it's just too far for us um, from a technical uh, perspective, it, we're you know we're just not going to do it. We'll refer it out. But um, yeah, if they need strategy, if they need help with strategy, financial, business strategy, um, either either or, that's something that we'll get involved with. So how how did your firm kind of end up? They're kind of offering virtual CFO uh, services because I'm always I'm always kind of curious when I hear a CPA firm kind of doing something that's maybe a little bit a uh, little bit different from kind of traditional services. Um, you know, it, did you just kind of see a need in the market, and so therefore, you know, you kind of said, "Hey, that's something that's something I could do and I could do well," or was it just sort of you know I had enough clients asking about it and I finally got sick of telling them no, <laughs> so, yeah. so I just embraced it. I saw a need in the market and it really came from a data perspective. Um, so when I, when I was, when I had my side hustle, I was doing work for a marketing agency as a virtual CFO. And at the time, like, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, but, I, and I had a finance role in my, in my nine to five. And so I kind of just pieced it together and figured it out. Like, well, you know, this is what I do in my nine to five. And then this is what these folks need. And, you know, these two things can work together. So, uh, I had that experience leading into when I went full time out on my own. My second client was an agency. My third client might have been my fourth was an agency. And so from there, it was like, okay, this this is starting to make sense because uh, generally these businesses are very data driven. Um, mm -hmm. That's where a lot of my my expertise lies. Uh, right. Certainly, some yeah. You know, certainly, I think that that's something that separates me from other accountants. And yeah. It was just like, well, I can help these people and they need help and my model fits their model. So right. it's, it's not a situation where you've got inventory, which is very difficult to automate or some sort of other process, which is very difficult to automate, very difficult to get data out of and, and do it in a way that's um, you know, real time and you can be proactive and things like that. So uh, from there, it was, it was just fairly obvious. Like, I, you know, when I, got in, when I got into it, it was, you know, I need to find a niche. I don't know where that niche is going to be. Right. And, but I need to find one and it just yeah. kind of fell out of the sky, hit me in the face. And it was, it, you know, just seemed to make sense at that point. I think it's interesting too, because I, I feel like a lot of uh, CPA firms are almost trying to be everything to everybody these days. I mean, uh, you know, that certainly seems to be the way that, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of firms are trending. It's, uh, you know, uh, firms are getting involved in, uh, you know, investment management as an example, um, you know, and they're doing uh, kind of more, uh, you know, kind of more across the board services, whereas you, uh, you know, really kind of, you know, so, and you call it, you, you yourself called it a sort of a niche area uh, that needed service. And you said, you know what? No, I'm going to focus in on this particular area and I'm just going to do that really, really well. Right. Exactly. Like we could do investment management, but sure. probably not well. <laughs> so why? <laughs> so why? Um, we don't really do financial plans. 
personal financial plans, I, we could do it, but probably not well. So right. you know, those are the things we refer out. What what sort of because uh, when you're working with a firm, I mean, uh, you you mentioned that uh, you you do some uh, uh, you know can do some strategic decision making and help them kind of work through that. Uh, do you find it difficult because a lot of times uh, you know and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I, I think you're you're working from your own office. Um, you're not necessarily on site with them. Most of the time, I mean, so, you know, CFOs provide kind of a leadership role. And I think, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, some CPAs, they say, you know, kind of virtual services really don't work because you're not there, you know, and, and there's something powerful about kind of by being in that client's office and being able to meet kind of face to face. Have you sort of seen like a disconnect between, you know, kind of when you're kind of in the office and versus like when you're when you're virtual or or does that are we at a point now where that just doesn't matter anymore? Um, all of the above. So, OK, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of talk through that. So. I think clients, especially the clients that we're working with are clamoring for that virtual CFO service, whether it's exactly what my firm offers or some variation thereof. You know, some people call it CAS, like whatever you want to call it, it doesn't really matter. Right. But they're looking for those services. Now, if you're going to do it in a way that it's not virtual CFO and it's just fractional CFO and you're actually going out to the client's offices, I think generally that's going to put you into more of a generalist perspective and it's going to limit you locally for the most okay. part, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. from a practical standpoint, especially during COVID. Um, if you're going to do the virtual CFO piece, then, I mean, by definition, you're virtual and you're not going to the client's office, at least not as much, right? Right. So sure. there's definitely some information that gets lost. And that's what we found. And we found that to be true very recently. The way that I initially tried to address that was you're, we're going to meet on some sort of a cadence. We're going to meet regularly. And just a heads up, the, the first three things I'm going to ask you are, What's going well? What's not going well? How can we be most helpful? Yep. And that's great. But I, what I found is it only gets you to a point because um, yeah. okay. it, it, it just only gets you to a point. So now what we've gotten to is, hey, if you're going to have leadership meetings, invite us and then we'll just show up because, I mean, everybody's meeting virtually now anyway. So it's not really that big of a deal or they can just zoom you in. But, you know, doesn't matter. It's, it's, yeah. it's easy. It's easy now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you invite us and then we're going to be the fly on the wall. The way it's different from us doing a financial review meeting because we're not the show. We're just the fly on the wall. We can provide perspective if you want, but it's going to provide a lot more context when we're actually talking about financial information and we're there to ask questions or answer questions if, if they come up. But that provides a lot more context to us as advisors than I think what, uh, what we've gotten historically by just asking the three questions or doing it you know, the way that we were. So we're, we're continuing to iterate. We certainly, we're not perfect. Sure. Um, but that's the way that we're thinking about it and addressing it at the moment. So, it, I mean, it sounds like you're really sort of par it, making sort of a conscious effort to kind of build that relationship with the client and kind of uh, be a part of the culture that that the client is, you know, kind of kind of building. Um, uh, so exactly. it's more than just kind of the services themselves kind of melding. It's I mean, it's you really trying to sort of, uh, you know, uh, be involved in what the client is doing. Is that is that fair? Exactly. Yeah. When something new pops up and you see it in the financials, but you don't really have the context to it, you, you bring it up in a financial review meeting, like you may get the whole story, you may not. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. And then how do you start to connect all of those dots that the client is going through so you can actually provide provide the value that they need and expect? So the way that you do that is just insert yourself more. Yeah, I, I used to um, I used to call that uh, the accountant's sixth uh, sixth sense, and I don't mean like I see dead people. I mean like the ability to like look down a set of financial statements and be like, "That's right, that's right, that's right." Up, oh, that's not. <laughs> yeah, you know something yep. happened here. I got I got to dig in on that, and uh, I think uh, most of our listeners would probably identify with that at least to a point. Uh, you know. Sure. Um, you know, uh, for sure. So one of the unique things I think about, uh, you know, going out on your own is, uh, marketing yourself. Uh, that's, that's something that I think is, uh, is a bit unique. And I think for a lot of, uh, financial professionals, I, I think that they're a bit, um, surprised by that, uh, because, uh, you know, especially I, I'm not sure that, uh, marketing is necessarily in, uh, sort of the, the classic CPA skill set. Uh, I know that for me personally, it was not, um, you know, 
Um, but you have to tell people about your product, uh, your services. Um, how did you kind of, you know, how, how did you kind of feel about uh, marketing yourself? And uh, just talk about your experience of trying to just kind of, kind of, uh, you know, tell the, uh, you know, potential clients about about your services. Sure. So I think marketing was probably the most fun piece of the business. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I, I'm probably in the minority among financial professionals there, but. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I got into servicing agencies because I just I I just find it fascinating and you know that's been the story for me going all the way back to the high school. But that's I guess that's neither here nor there. So what I would tell you is that I have thrown literally everything against the wall. I think at this point. <laughs> so I've done Facebook ads, I've done Google ads, I've done YouTube ads, uh, I've done BNI, still in BNI, um, YouTube channel, podcasts uh natural google search or uh, organic google search um what else sponsored events you know that I, i've thrown it all sure. the way, right yeah and yeah. invariably the the clients that are coming to us at this point who are good solid qualified clients who are gonna who are gonna you know pay the higher fees they've all found us through organic google search and the way that we've kind of gotten there was i had a marketing agency that came on early days and we focused on, um, you know, an inbound type strategy where I put out a lot of content over, you know, several year period. And, you know, she told me upfront, she's like, it's a long game. And as it turns out, it has been right. Sure. Um, yeah. And I've consulted with other marketing professionals about paid ads. I've done it myself and, and that whole thing. And, you know, I, I just don't think it, anything beats long-term content production. That's going to get you at the top of Google. And targeted, targeted content, I think is the key. We're, you know, we're producing content and writing blog posts and doing videos and things specifically for marketing agencies, things that resonate with them, questions that we've gotten from other clients, that sort of thing. And invariably, you know, it takes time, but, you know, it's worked. I think I think you said a couple of really interesting things there. Uh, one is is uh, that it is not sort of a a short game. I think that uh, maybe one of the more um, mistaken ideas out there is is that I got to come up with this uh, stellar ad that is going to be sort of eye popping and it's going to get everybody's attention. And if I do that one time, um, I'm going to get a lot of hits. Um, you know, and. That's not really true. I mean, uh, I know that with at least with my own experiences, I think uh, you and I are probably similar that, um, you know, if you keep putting things out there, whatever it is that kind of fits you is if you keep putting that that content out there, eventually good things happen. But it's not a one and done. It's not something that uh, we're going to do one time and it's going to hit and that's going to be great. It's uh, it's over long periods of time that uh, we ultimately find success um 100%. is is that yeah is it, i mean does that does that resonate to, um... oh absolutely i mean when i went out on my own i was like man you know i'm just gonna run a hundred dollars worth of facebook ads yeah and you know before you know it i'm gonna have like virtual cfo clients just falling you know just falling on the door and it just right. doesn't work that way it just, it just doesn't and you know it takes a while for you to find your voice it takes a while for you to find your niche but at least in my experience anyway. And it takes it takes a little while for you to figure out exactly what to what kind of content to produce that's going to solve their specific pain points and what's going to resonate. And then it takes a while for Google, like just to figure yeah. out what's relevant to whoever search and it it just takes time. That's I mean, that's that's it. I, th I think uh, all of those, I think, are good points. Um, one of the things, uh, too, that I often talk to my own clients about is just uh, kind of the, uh, you know, when you're advertising for yourself, uh, no matter kind of how you're advertised, um, it, it's got to be something that you kind of enjoy. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be brutal. So, like, you know, if I am, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, reach my clients and I decide I'm going to do podcasting, but I just really don't like having conversations with other people, <laughs> you know, um, if that's just not really my thing, I don't know that the, you know, that a podcast is necessarily going to, is, is necessarily going to be the right thing for me because I'm just going to like, you know, really dislike what I'm doing over a long period of time. <laughs> sure. Um, I, so, I mean, so I, I would imagine at least part of marketing is, you know, is also your personality and what you kind of like and and how you think that you can kind of carve, you know, kind of your, your niche. Uh, there's gotta be some of your personality in there, I think. 
For sure. Um, because people are going to see right through it. If you don't like yeah. doing it, or if you don't like talking about it, people are going to see right through it and they're just not going to engage you. And that, you know, so there's that piece of it too. And then the other piece of it is you're just not going to want to do it. So if you're like, Hey, you know, I'm going to produce this podcast and you really hate it. Like you're going to do one podcast every three months. You're just not going to get the value from it. And it's going to be a pain every single time you do it. So it's not at that point, it's not even worth doing. Right. Do something that you like to do and, you know, talk about things that you like to talk about. And then, you know, it'll work out at some point. It takes a minute, but it'll work out. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, I think that that means a lot. Um, what would you say to maybe uh, some other CPA firms if maybe they're thinking about uh, offering uh, you know a specialized service uh, that's uh, you know is maybe a little bit different? Um, any any words of advice or maybe uh, words of advice to people that uh, are maybe currently thinking about going out on their own? I would say if you can find a niche, whether or not that's a vertical or a horizontal niche. Um, but find a niche for sure. And one of the things that we've kind of learned the hard way is standardization. Okay. Try to standardize as much as possible because otherwise, you know, it, it, it turns into a pain point or several pain points when you're trying to staff, when you're trying to you know, manage utilization, when you're trying to manage a tech stack, um, it, get, it gets very, very difficult. So standardization before automation, number one, and then number two, find a niche and be patient. So three things. Yeah, patience. Uh, patience is uh, uh, definitely means a lot. I think uh, you know. I think uh, especially when folks are going out on their own. I always tell people that I always think that there's kind of like this uh, uh, this uh, kind of oh my gosh moment where they say, "Hey, I'm out on my own. Okay, now what?" Uh, you know, I think <laughs> a lot of people are. Uh, uh, you know, there's always that kind of piece of uncertainty. Um, you know, kind of when you go out on your own, and and it just sort of takes some time to develop. And I think uh, you know some patience, and uh, I think also patience with yourself, I think means a lot too. I mean, uh, cause, uh, no matter how good you are kind of in your particular area, you're going to make mistakes when you go out on your own. Cause, uh, and, uh, it's, it's just going to happen. And, uh, there's going to be times where you try things and it just doesn't work out. Sure. Just be patient with yourself and, you know, be open and honest with your clients. And if you make a mistake and you will, I mean, it's just, everybody's human, right? Yeah. Just, you know, say, I'm sorry. And just try to make it right. Um, yeah. That's, that's all you can do. And it's just like any other business. But I mean, CPAs generally have got high demand skills, very skilled people. I mean, all very smart. It's You're going to be successful, right. but you have to give yourself time to be successful. Um, and you just have to do what you like to do. And eventually that will resonate with the market and you'll be just fine. That sounds great. Well, hey, uh, Chris, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Is If uh, folks would like to get a hold of you, uh, what would be the best way for them uh, them to do that? Absolutely. Best way is through the website, betterwaycpa.com. So go to betterwaycpa.com, folks, uh, and uh, you know, reach out to Chris uh, with questions. Uh, or if uh, you know, maybe you're thinking uh, uh, to yourself about uh, the possibility of offering virtual CFO services, um, I, I think uh, Chris is a great resource there. So, uh, so uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us, and I uh, appreciate your time. Yes, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Accountable. Be sure to subscribe for more interviews and insights from today's business leaders. David Peters is a registered representative offering securities through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Carroll Financial Associates, a registered investment advisor. Peters Tax Preparation, David Peters Financial, Carroll Financial, and Satera Advisor Networks are not affiliated. He is located at 1657 West Broad Street, Unit 5, Richmond, Virginia, 23220, and can be reached at 804-332-1373. The views depicted in this material are for information purposes only and not necessarily those of Satera. They should not be considered specific advice or recommendations for any individual.